Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure for me to be here this morning, and I appreciate all of you coming out uh, for you know what I believe is, is probably one of the most important uh, topics that you will uh, learn about in your career. We learn a lot about how to take better care of our patients, and I think that it's really important to balance that by learning how to take better care of ourselves as well. I'm going to talk about staying healthy as a physician. As Laura has kindly uh, mentioned in her introduction, I am a psychiatrist and uh, all of my patients for almost 25 years in Ottawa have been other physicians. And so what I'm going to give you is really a distillation of what I've learned in my own practice and, and pass it on to you. And I'm going to today do it from a, a fairly proactive process. So talk about physician health from the wellness point of view as well as the, uh, uh, um, instead of the disease point of view. Um, those initials after my name tell you that I'm qualified to talk to you about uh, physician health and physician stress. The uh, letters that are not there are MOT, which stands for mother of three. <laughs> now this is, I think, my main qualification to talk to you about uh, managing your stress. I had a set of twins when my older one was about 14 months old, and uh, these three guys, uh, and, and I was, uh, I guess, in my last year of residency, my first year of fellowship uh, during that time. These guys are now 21, 21, and 22, and they continue to teach me different things about uh, managing stress and work-life balance. As I said, I'm gonna to talk to you about wellness from, from really a positive, proactive point of view. And, re, and a lot of my work lately has been looking at physician resilience. You know, when I look at colleagues, and I think in the same situation, what is it that allows one person to, you know, to manage well and to stay healthy in a situation where others have difficulty with this. So thinking more and more about the concept of physician resilience. And resilience actually, we all think about you know, the, the bouncing ball and bouncing back from, from difficult situations. But in fact, I, you know, I think resilience has three main components. And the first is, even before the crisis happens, being prepared. That's what you're doing here, which is really learning about some of these situations, thinking about what kinds of things can happen to us in medicine and how can I manage and how do I have some skills to manage for that. And you know, before you leave today, hopefully you will have at least a few little tips in that. But then the second is during the actual event, what are you going to do to cope through it? And then third, finally, not just getting through, but bouncing back further and higher, actually growing, actually learning something from this process and this situation so that you're better prepared for the next one, right? So really how, you know, my hope is to get you thinking about how can you enhance all three parts of this. Over the years, with my work with colleagues, I've come up with what I call the five C's of resilience. And so I'm seeing that there are many different aspects to what keeps us well, and I'd like to go through most of those with you today. So we're looking at control, we're looking at having a sense of commitment, we're looking at having a feeling of connection, being able to you know, maintain and sustain a sense of calmness when you need, and then as well a focus on self-care. So let's start with the first one, having a sense of control and a sense of confidence. And a lot of what we do that helps us feel more in control of our day-to-day -day is really to be more self-aware, to try and figure out who are we as people? Like what is it about us as physicians that makes us more vulnerable to stress? And there are some traits that we all do share. And then once we have that sense of self-awareness, how can we use that to build a sense of confidence and then to think about how we can constantly feel that we're in control of the things that we can control? So I'll try and share some of those with you today. <clears throat> so over the last few years, what I've realized is that we're all actually not that different, right? And I've been able to call some common personality traits that I think we all share and that I'm going to you know, help you look at today. So we're very conscientious. We spend a lot of time attending to detail, right? And we try and do our very best. And so, you know, this is when um, you're on the wards or you're doing your shift and emerge, and you wanna make sure that, you know, everything's wrapped up, all the patients are taken care of before you end your shift and so you're not leaving a lot of stuff for the next person, right? Again, that's an extra time, extra attention, which of course takes extra energy for you to do. We're people pleasing. We want people to like us. And again, we spend a lot of time doing that extra, 
just to make sure that people think we're good, people think that we're committed, that we care, and that they think positively of us. Right? Again, you can imagine the time and energy that that takes. We have a huge sense of responsibility. Part of the reason we do this is because we feel very responsible. We feel that it's up to us. And here's the kicker. We end up feeling responsible about things that actually aren't our responsibility. Right? So, you know, I have uh, colleagues in Ottawa that say, you know, and, and particularly around the Stanley Cup uh, time, right, that, you know, I can't watch the Sens play, right, because every time I do, they lose, like somehow that's their responsibility, right? So what you really want to do is to recognize we do this. And of course, in medicine, there's a lot of responsibility that's assigned to us. But here's what we do. We walk into a scenario and we assume it. We just take on responsibility of things, even if they're not ours to take on. And if we don't, even we see something that might, we could maybe pay attention to and we don't, we feel very guilty. And that guilt, again, continues to perpetuate that sense of responsibility and makes us do the things even if they take more time and energy. We're unrelentingly perfect. In medicine, this is a little bit of what I call the curse of the gifted. You know, if we were average, life would be a lot easier. We just wouldn't worry so much. We wouldn't try so hard. If all I knew, you know, if I knew I could just... If I get a 70 and I do okay, that's great. But it's when you start to make 90 and 95 and 98 in your clinical work, when you start to approximate perfection, I can't actually give the best possible pa you know, patient care. And I want to attain that. And once you've achieved it, it keeps you hooked. You wanna keep doing this every single time. It'd be a lot easier if we weren't so capable. And, you know, and again, we don't see ourselves this way. We just see this as the norm. And this level of perfectionism is something that um, takes a lot of time and can sometimes paralyze us. Probably one of the most unusual referral sources I had was a colleague in Ottawa who was referred to me from medical records. Now, as you know, medical records doesn't routinely go around, you know, um, referring physicians to psychiatrists. <laughs> but in this case, they just all got together and said, that's it. We're tired of doing these 30-page referral notes back to the family physician. And, you know, and this person would be very conscientious and very perfectionistic and go through all the possible things and say, you know, this long differential diagnosis. It could be this, but it's not because of this. And it could be this, but it's not. And really felt that their value was not just in giving some... Um, some decisions about this patient, some recommendations, but also in uh, teaching the family physician who had referred the patient. So you can see, being this conscientious, trying to be so perfect, again, it's not always in our best interests. We like to be in control. And again, that's really important um, and necessary in your workplace, right? You know, when the MVA is wheeled into the emergency room and you, lo you look at the patient and you do the assessment and you ask the nurses and the IV techs and the x-ray techs and, you know, all the things and you write your orders and, and think about that, right? We write orders in medicine, but we do all that because we want to do the best for the patient. But the reason that works is because the system in medicine, the system in your emergency room or in your clinic is set up to give the physician that level of control. At the end of your shift, when you walk in through your front door, I suspect the system in your house is not necessarily set up to do the same, right? And so you can see how the things that um, help us succeed at work are actually the very same that cause us stress in our personal lives. Chronic self-doubts. Of all the you know, personality traits I'm gonna tell you about, this is the one that surprises me consistently. I know about it and it still catches me. I've seen some of the, you know, some colleagues that are really the cornerstone of medicine in, in Canada, in, in uh, certainly our province and, and the cities that we have. And they too all feel this, the sense that just managed to fool enough people so far, right? But you know, and what I need to do is just kind of keep my head down and walk around, not you know, kick up too much of a fuss and maybe nobody will catch me out, right? And we have that sense of being an imposter and just kind of slipping through so far. And we're all just waiting for that one thing to happen where there it is, like there it is, game over, our cover's blown, everyone's gonna realize how little we know and we're just waiting for that to happen. 
And if you feel that, remember that you're in good company, and I'll you know, uh, uh, take a minute to explain where that comes from, but this is very prevalent for us. And you can see as a result why, you know, because of that, we then work even harder to try and do our very, you know, very possible, the, the very best we can do. I said earlier we like to please people. Again, here's the trouble. When we do, we don't know how to accept it. We're very uncomfortable with approval when we actually get it. And again, I'm sure every single person in this room has had a situation where someone said to you, good job, that was great. And what do we say? We say, well, wasn't that big a deal? Or, you know, anyone else could have done the same thing or just happened to be in the right place at the right time. It was just luck. And we do all of these things to actually dismiss this. Right? So here we are looking for this approval. When we receive it, we do things to dismiss it. And you can see how it perpetuates that cycle of working harder again to do more, to get more approval. And finally, we're so busy doing all that, we're very good at delaying our own gratification. We put things off that are good for us. Right? We'll get around to them. We know it's important to take care of ourselves and to be healthy. And we'll do that as soon as, right? just as soon as we've done whatever else. And again, this is um, a behavior pattern that served us well. Right? It was what allowed us to study hard and get the marks we needed to perhaps to get into the universities we wanted and get into medical school, then get into the residency training program we want. And then, you know, it's just as soon as I set up my practice and there's always something else. Again, here's one of those things that impacts not just us, but people around us as well, because when you're making decisions to put things off for yourself, in fact, you end up you know, putting things off for the family as well, right? If you're waiting to go on holiday, so are they. So all of these traits, and as you go through them, I'm sure some of you are going, yep, check, 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 check. And my goal is not to say, quit being like that, right? In fact, we're all like that, I'm like that. The crucial part is to understand that we are, to recognize when we need to be and perhaps when it's less important. Right? So to be able to make those choices uh, more consciously in the moment. As I said, this is why we succeed, but this is also why we're very vulnerable to the stresses that we are under. Where does this come from? This is about a psychiatrics I'm going to get with you, so bear with me. We're not going to go into toilet training and all those issues, but we are going to talk about a little bit of growing up as a child. And here's the important thing, that the main, the number one conclusion that we reach about ourselves, our sense of self, happens at a very early age. So about the time that you're seven, eight, nine, sort of you know, pre-adolescent, latency age, is when you come up with a sense of who you are. And here's what happens. We look at all the important adults in our life and we look at how they might treat us. Or remember, it's our perception of what they're doing with us. And we conclude something about ourselves as a result. We look at how they treat our siblings. We look at how, and some of these are obviously our parents, could be our teachers. We look at how our teachers treat other people um, in our class. And all of that, we're unconsciously concluding something. Right? The problem though, is that at this stage, when we're coming up with this major conclusion, we're actually quite limited in our thinking. Right? Children at this stage think very concretely. They haven't learned yet to abstract um, and, and think in, you know, in, in a more abstract, in a more uh, advanced way. So it's very concrete. At this stage, children are thinking, you know, our parents are right. They know everything all the time. How many people have children at this stage? sort of pre-adolescence, okay. So you know, they still come to you, they still ask you for some things, they ask you questions, they think you might know some things still, right? Wait a few years, that will all change, right? But now it's still happening. At this stage, children think that their parents are supposed to love them, be proud of them, tell everyone how great they are, brag about them all the time. And at this stage, children absolutely believe that they're the center of the world, right? They look at them, they look at what's going on around them, and because it's very concrete, it all somehow reflects back to them. Let me give you a good example of that. So, you know, when, um, when my twins were uh, about, I guess, five or six, uh, thinking very concretely, I remember we had this incident where, you know, they're in the playroom and I hear them escalating and suddenly they're not able to settle this, whatever this little squabble is. And so I wait for a while and now they still haven't managed it. So finally I'm like fed up, right? So I go down to the play playroom and I grab one of them and I say, up to your room. Now to this day, 
he insists that I have the wrong, I got the wrong twin, right? <laughs> but at the time, I wasn't, I just wanted it done. So I said, I don't really care, I'm not listening, just don't be together, go up to your room. And he's mad, right? Because he's thinking this is totally unfair. And so he's, you know, stomping, right? And I, so, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm, I know you're upset, you need to go up to your room. So he stomps every step of the way up, up the stairs. I can hear him upstairs in his bedroom, and he's stomping on the bedroom floor. And then at one point, he gets up, and he jumps on the bed, and he's stomping on the bed, and he realizes, he looks out the window, and a car stops. So he jumps some more, and another car stops. And he said for weeks, every chance he got, right, he'd go up to his room, he'd jump on the bed, see how many cars he could make stop. Until the one day, he saw the stop sign outside his window. <laughs> right? It's a perfect example of how kids think at that stage, very concretely. What happens around me happens because of me. But that's the stage that we're all at. We're coming up with a sense of who we are. And what I've seen working with colleagues is that we've all had some sense that, you know, our parents didn't really think we were so great. They weren't bragging about me all the time. Now, how could that happen? For some of us, you know, sadly, we did grow up in traumatic families where, we, where there was some sort of trauma or abuse, and you can see how a child in that situation wouldn't feel that their parents thought they were so great. But most of us didn't. Sometimes we come from families where it wasn't what happened, but it's what didn't happen. So people weren't physically available to give us the positive feedback we might need, or they might have been physically there but not emotionally available to give us the feedback. Um, I think about my scenario, it wasn't either of those things. I came from an immigrant family, and again, I think many people in the room could relate to that. You come home with a 98, and someone says, well, what happened to the other two marks, right? And remember, you know, as a parent now, I can see the goal is to motivate your children to do their best, right? And, and absolutely, as an immigrant family, I think it's even more important because, you know, success in this country was going to be related to education. But as a child at that stage of thinking, I'm not thinking that at all. I'm thinking, my parents are supposed to be proud of me. They're right not to be. They know everything, so they, they, they must be accurate. That, that must be the truth. And because I'm the center of the world, it must be my fault that somehow I'm not doing enough to, to, get that, you know, to get the feedback that I need. So as a result, we develop what I call the sense of history or personal historian, which tells us you don't measure up. Right? And then what we do, because we're bright, is we unconsciously, um, it's like, it's like uh, having a hypothesis in a debate that you have to now um, you know, try, and, uh, try and support. So my hypothesis is I have to support that I don't measure up. So I look for things, right? I edit things out, I distort things, I uh, take things out of context to prove this. And in fact, when I get some information that tells me I did measure up, I get the good for you, I dismiss it because it doesn't fit my hypothesis. Right? And so we do this whole process unconsciously to try and reinforce the sense that we don't really measure up. This is really important just in terms of understanding you know, the nature of the beast. We come primed into most situations, and it leads me to what I've developed, what I call the 90-10 rule, which is in any situation where you're feeling unsure, you're feeling hesitant, you're feeling like maybe, you know, like you're, I don't know, you're about to you know, give rounds, you're about to go in to see a patient that is very seriously ill, and you're not 100% sure about what to do. Right? Remember, 90% of you is already primed to question yourself. Only a tenth of what you're feeling is actually accurate for that scenario. And in that moment, you could use this pie chart or bar graph or whatever you want to, but basically think about what your reaction is and bring it down to a tenth of it, because that's all you need to actually go through that situation. Okay, so how do you know when you're getting into trouble? Again, part of self-awareness is knowing what these early signs are. The first is an increase in physical pro problems and illnesses. So you start to get more ill, right? So let's say more year, most years you have the one cold. But this year, right, this is your third or fourth one, and it's actually lasting a little bit longer. It's harder to shake off. You should start to think, where's my level of stress? It must be higher than normal. Start to have more problems with relationships. 
that you're a little bit more negative, you're more cynical, you're grumpier, there's a few more conflicts, things are more tense around you. You come into work and you know, the nurse makes a comment like, oh, you must have taken your grumpy pills today, right? You know, that should, again, raise your level of awareness that I'm not at my best. You start to think more negatively. And this is very common. And again, we've all done this. We've all uh, done the, you know, where you realize I'm not as positive, I'm not as empathetic, I'm not as compassionate as I could be. Um, uh, and, and I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm negative about things. Um, instead of, in, in Emerge, that happens a lot, right? And I actually had an Emerge doc in my practice who had gotten to this point And he said to me, because you know what? Every single patient that comes to me wants something from me. I know it, that's just the way it is. And he said, in fact, I am going to get this big button, like big button put right here, I'll put on my lab coat, and it just says, what the F do you want from me? Right? Because he says, that's really the only question I have to answer. Now I could tell, right, that he obviously was not enjoying his work as much as he could, and probably not as compassionate as he normally is. Significant increase in bad habits. As I say that, I want everyone to think about what's your bad habit? Of course, we all only have one, right? So think about what that could be. When I first had the twins, right, people would ask me how my day was, right? A good day was a two Oreo day. Like a bad day was a 12 Oreo day. So I know for me, that's my bad habit, right? I'm reaching out uh, and, I, and I've sort of tried to keep that in mind. Um, you know, when I open up the cupboards, I'm looking for cookies. Obviously it's not the cookies that I want. It's a little bit of time to myself and a little bit of time to just relax and rest. Think about what it is for you. Sometimes it can be overeating. It can be, uh, um, you know, coming home and having that extra drink a little bit more regularly. It can be uh, spending too much money. There's a lot to be said for retail therapy, but again, you know, it doesn't last, and it's more a symptom than, than the solution. The other thing I want to tell you is that your bad habit doesn't have to be something you do. It could be something good that you used to do that you've stopped doing. So think about that as well, right? So again, I know for me that, you know, when I'm more stressed, it's a lot easier for me to, you know, be up at night thinking about it or worrying about it a little bit and not sleeping as well. And then it's really hard to get up at 5.30 the next day and go for my run. And if I look back and think, gee, it's been two or three weeks since I've gotten up and ran in the mornings, then that's my sign, right? So think about what that is for you because then you can catch it earlier. Exhaustion is obviously not an early sign. Most of us push ourselves and we can manage to do things, um, you know, despite how unwell we feel. Exhaustion is Mother Nature's way of sort of sitting on your chest and saying, you can't get up and do this one more day. These uh, signs can lead to what we call burnout. Burnout is not a psychiatric diagnosis, but it is actually quite a defined entity and it's really just stress over a long period of time. It's more common in professions where you work with people and you help people. So you can see how in medicine, we're perfectly primed to be, uh, um, you know, to, to be uh, vulnerable to depression, to, um, to burnout. Three stages. The first is emotional exhaustion. I can't tell you how ill some of our colleagues are, and certainly when I see them, and they continue to work in the workplace. Nobody at work would have any idea. Right? So what, here's what happens, is we suck it up and we get through it, and we do fine. And people will say to me, you know what, I'm functioning well at work, and I say, well, you know what, actually, that doesn't mean anything, right? Because we can do that. What happens, though, is that at the end of the day, we're totally exhausted. We have nothing left to give. So this is when, you know, you can, you, you can be great at work, but you come home and, you know, you bite your uh, partner's head off at some silly little thing. You just have nothing left. Um, Colleagues will tell me at this point they'll come home and they'll just put the newspaper up, right? And it's a very tangible uh, barrier, give me a few minutes, I don't really want to talk to you right now. And actually, um, you know, it's usually the people in our lives that want something more from us and they're the hardest for us. That leads us to the second phase, which is depersonalizing. We just pull away from those people because it's too draining. In the workplace, you'll see this. People don't come to meetings like this. People don't uh, um, eat in the cafeteria. It's just too much work to talk to people, right? They'll come, they'll do the work because that's what they, have, they can manage. But to actually talk to people, too much. Or if they do come, they'll come late, leave early, because then they don't have to do that chit-chat stuff, right? That's the draining part. And then that leads to the third stage, where now it starts to impact us as work, 
at work. We start to question, what is it about this job that we really liked? Uh, we don't feel that same sense of personal achievement that we you know, used to get from medicine. And a lot of colleagues will come to me at this stage and say, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. I have to say, there is a lot to be said for consciously assessing what it is you're doing in medicine, seeing do I still like it, do I want to continue this, um, and about every six to, you know, five to seven years, you should be making some sort of minor modification so you can continue to enjoy this. But that's a very positive, proactive process. What we're talking about here in burnout is negative and reactive. It's like, I'm not happy, I hate where I am, I want to get the heck out of here. Right? Absolutely the wrong time to make a major career decision. I said earlier that burnout is not a psychiatric diagnosis, but you need to know it can have some very serious consequences. And uh, we're not going to talk about all of these today. It's outside the scope of what we're focusing on. But to know that you can have some professional problems, particularly if you're negative and sarcastic and unhappy, you can see how that could lead to complaints, um, difficulty with relationships both at home as well as at work, uh, difficulty with your own physical health as well as some psychiatric problems, anxiety, depression, bipolar illness, probably the, I mean, the most common of what I would see in the office practice, uh, some eating disorders as well. Uh, so important to know that these all can happen to us. What's really important is to know that none of us are immune, right? This is not something that we look around and if I say to you, oh, you know, depression among physicians is one in three, right? That at, you know, one in three physicians will have a serious episode of depression at some point in their life. You don't want to look at the people on either side of you and say, well, it'll be one of them, not me. It could be any of us. And what I've realized is it doesn't matter how, how bright you are, how capable you are, how competent you are. You can take any highly functioning person and put them in what for them is an unhealthy environment and they too are going to become unhealthy. Right? So the, the importance is to watch out for those signs in yourself and as well as in your colleagues. Okay, so remember I said, so we know there's some self-awareness here. What about a sense of control? It's important to recognize that our sense of feeling stress is actually directly linked to our feeling in control. In fact, the number one reason, the number one cause of stress is when we feel in that situation we don't have any control that we're kind of stuck, we're trapped, we're backed into a corner. That's the feeling. If you go back to any you know, recent situation where you've had some element of stress, there would be a sense of that. There's nothing I can do about this. If that's the feeling that causes stress, then the solution actually is to challenge that feeling. Right? And, and so let's look at how we're going to do that. So when you think about, OK, I'm feeling a lot of stress right now, think about all the things that are causing you stress. If there's a lot of them, Write them down, make a list. And you know, it doesn't matter if the list is as long as your arm, just write them all down. It's very valuable, just identify the stressors. And then to think of if I could pick one thing off this list that I could fix today, what would that be? Okay, so now you've also prioritized. Then you want, to, you, know, you want to remember me telling you, you actually have more control than you think you do. Here's what we do, we're bright, so we look at this very logically. And we recognize pretty early on that we're just a small cog in the wheel here, right? So I am in a certain situation, there's me, and then there's, you know, the, my colleagues, my department, the patients, the hospital system that I work in, uh, the city that I work in, healthcare in this province, healthcare in this country. You can imagine as we expand out, we're just maybe what, like one or two percent of the issue. So what we do logically, because this is how we solve all our problems in medicine, is we look at the 98%, because that's the bulk of the problem. And we look for how, to see how we can make changes there. What we forget, though, is that control is an illusion. We actually have no control over anyone or anything outside of us. Um, what we're, you know, and so here we are, focusing on this stuff around us, of which I've just told you, you have no control. So surprise, you feel like you have no control. What you're forgetting is you, right? It might only be one or two percent of the problem, but of that, you actually have a hundred percent control. And what's in that? That's your thoughts, your attitudes, your reactions, your expectations of yourself, your expectations of people around you, your skills and strengths. Those are the things that you have full control over, right? And so that's what I want you to really be thinking about for the, for the rest of our conversation here. There are times at work where you may have to set some limits because you have some control over that, right? Here are some questions to ask. Ask yourself, 
Do I want to do this? Am I the only one who can do this? Is this the right phase in my life? What's in it for me right now? And is this the best time, right? So once you start to ask these questions, it's not just that now I'm never helping anybody out. It's just, you know what? This might not be the best thing for me to take right now. And if that's the case, then you know what? You have to say no to some things that you can control. Three easy steps to saying no once you've gone through that thinking process. So the first is you open your mouth. The second, you say no. The third, you close your mouth. Right? And it's the closing your mouth that's really hard for us. Right? What do we do? We go on and on and on. I want, to, I want you to know that you know, I really did think about it and I wish I could help you out and I really do care and I'm not a mean and nasty person, but I really can't. We go on and on. Right? Remember, if you've thought it through and you can say no and you, that's what you decide to do, you just say no. Right? No is a complete sentence. So that's a little bit about looking at the sense of control. Uh, there's a lot to be said for un remembering the sense of commitment to medicine. And what happens as we go through later stages of stress and burnout is we stop, right? We stop remembering that. Um, we just want to get the heck out of there. So very important to remember, and, and, uh, and I will leave you with these slides, and I want you to take some time and actually answer these questions on your own. What was it about medicine that drew me to medicine? Because, you know, there'll be days in your practice where that's the only thing that's going to get you through that day. Remembering why you're here. Why you chose this in the first place. There are some, uh, you know, exercises you can do to think about what are my values, right? So maybe it's not that I hate this job or I hate the work I'm doing right now. It, maybe I'm just feeling overwhelmed. And actually, it's still in keeping with my values. I have to say what I realized for a lot of physicians when we get to the point where we're not happy at work, it's because there's something about work that's actually directly contravening our values. And so again, to be able to understand and, and acknowledge, recognize that, and to focus on that then instead of just throwing it all away. Reflecting, journaling, and so again, I encourage you to do that, and partly journaling about what was it about uh, medicine that I liked, and also think about a high moment in your career, right? A day in the job that was the best it could be. We've all had those moments, but they happen in the midst of so much busyness, and we don't actually stop and think about it. But it's important to do. And again, I would encourage all of you to do that. If I think back to, to my uh, career, one of, you know, there's been lots of times where people have, and colleagues are very good at saying thank you, and, and, and I see. I mean, the nice thing, I guess, for me is that, you know, I work with most of my uh, patients in other capacities, and I see how well they do. It's very meaningful to me. But, you know, I was at a conference once where I met a colleague, and, um, you know, I said hello to her and uh, introduced, uh, she introduced her little daughter. She would be maybe about seven or eight. And, um, and, you know, they went off in front of me and I was just walking down the hall. And this little girl kept looking back, right, three or four times at me. And at one point, she just left her mom's hand and came running down the hall. And she said to me, I know who you are. Thank you for giving my mom back to me. Right? That was like 15 years ago, and I still get all choked up when I, hear, when I say that, because that's very meaningful. That's why I do this. And there are many days where I need to remember that moment to help me keep doing that again. Right? So I want you to think about what was that moment for you. Think about your big rocks. So this made the rounds on the internet, and I know there's a lot of younger people in the room, so you're very um, aware of these kinds of things, and forgive me if I'm repeating, but their whole concept of this professor who's at the front of the room, he's got this big glass bowl, and he's got a big pile of big rocks, he's got a pile of small rocks, he's got a pile of pebbles, he's got a pile of sand. He says, how can we get all of this into this bowl? And they try many combinations and permutations. And you know, for example, if you fill the, sand, if you fill the bowl with sand, there's not much room for much else. The big rocks can't get in. What he tries to show is that, you know, you put your big rocks in first. Decide what's really important to you. And so if really the metaphor, that bowl represents your day or your life, figure out what's really important to you and put those big rocks in first. Those are your priority. The little rocks, actually, when you put them in, you know, come in, they fit in all around the big rocks. 
the little pebbles fit in all around that. You can actually throw in all the sand as well, right? So the order of what you fit into your day is crucial and make sure the things that are the most important to you get put in first. And just as a side, I'll say to an audience like this, the take home is not that, see, I can put everything into the bowl. That's not the take home. <laughs> I looked at that and I thought, I'm sure that's what colleagues say, but that's not. And remember, the take home is figure out what's important and put that in first. So let's talk about connections, because it's lonely. Right? The work that you do is really lonely. I have to tell you, nobody understands, really, what we do, unless they do it themselves. They know we have busy lives, and we talk about physician stress, and I remember when my boys were younger, and they were playing competitive soccer, and one of, the, um, uh, one of their teammates' mom was a, um, an obstetrician. And I knew she wasn't called the night before, and I was quite prepared to pick up her son. And, um, you know, and I, in fact, I did pick up her son and, and brought him to the game, and she joined us after. And she was telling me about this awful night she had, right, where they were, you know, the, it was busier than normal, but she had this one patient that, uh, um, it was a mother with twins, and, uh, you know, there were, there was a lot of complications, and at the end of the day, there was his emergency section, and one of the babies didn't do very well, and after a few hours, in fact, uh, didn't survive. And so she comes, she's been up all night, she's just barely, you know, coming to the game in time. She sits down, and she's just looking awful. And then, one of our neighbors pipes up, oh, I have had the most stressful morning. It took me 15 minutes to find Johnny's cleats this morning. That was her stress, right? And so, yeah, they kind of get that we have stress, but it's a different awareness, and that's okay, right? I'm not uh, criticizing it, but I just want you to know that other people don't fully understand what it is we're doing, and a lot of times it's fairly lonely. It, that, as a result, it can be lonely for people around us as well. And one of the things I want you to think about, so I'm trained as a child psychiatrist, and I use a lot of my skills in my practice every day, but I do, you know, use some of those analogies as well. And, you know, in psychiatry, we learn about the holding environment. And we learn that, you know, um, as a child, what, as, as a parent, you want to do is to create this holding environment for the child so that they actually feel held, they feel safe, they feel cared for, they feel taken well care of, and that somebody's thinking about them. And this is what allows them to start to separate, that they can, you know, crawl away and even crawl around the corner knowing that you're still there to hold them and, and be there for them if they need. And so I was thinking, wouldn't it be great if we could think about how do we do the same in medicine or in any relationship that we have? Medicine is full of relationships, right? So I want you to think about how do you make people in your life feel like you have creating a holding environment for them? So at work, Right? It's very helpful to think about you know, the work uh, that you're, that you're uh, doing, the colleagues that you work with, and creating a sense of community, and like getting to know people beyond who they are and the personal touch, and, what, you know, and, and figuring out who they are as people. It leads me to the emotional bank account. Right? So the emotional bank account is a concept where, basically, you are trying to create a bank account with every single person that you meet. Right. So, um, you know, I, um, if I were working with uh, Dave, I wouldn't just be, you know, handing over at shift and heading home. I might sort of ask him, yeah, I would, would I? Okay. No. <laughs> what I mean, so what you want to change is to say, you know, how was your day? What were you doing? What are you going to do tomorrow? What's the weekend look ahead for you? And then the next time I see him and we meet at shift again, I'd be able to say, oh, you went white water rafting over the weekend. What was that like? Right. And, uh, you know, how'd that work out? You know, you were going to take your little one out for the the first time, how did they like it, and I'm going to remember, it's kind of spooky, is that what you did? No. <laughs> but the, the thing is, um, how do you, you know, actually connect to people, figure out what it is that they like, and more importantly, remember it, and remember to follow up. It takes a little bit of work, but if you were doing that and building a, this account, so every time I do that, I make a big deposit into this bank account that we have emotionally. And, you know, hopefully I'm going to consciously try and do this. And with time, actually, it gets easier. It's just what you do, right? And, um, you know, so we, we've got a nice, healthy balance now. And so let's say the one day I'm finished a long shift and I am just, like, you know, fit to be tied, 
right? And Dave walks in all perky and I like bite his head off. Okay, like so big withdrawal, right? But hopefully there's still a balance here that we can work with. And because you know me, you're not thinking, oh my God, what a whatever. You're thinking, oh, she must have had a tough day, right? And you know, and imagine how much nicer your, your workplace would be if you were actively trying to create that kind of relationship with everyone that you were with, right? So think about initiating that. Think about how do you add fun to work? Um, how do you use each other for support? Uh, look at mentoring. Uh, mentoring is probably the, the most important relationship in becoming the professional you want to be. So encourage you to look for mentors, find people doing the kinds of things that you would like to do, and reach out and ask them to mentor you. I think that, um, you know, there, there are so many, and, and we have the sense that, oh, well, you know, we do have mentorship programs for medical students or residents. Remember, a mentor is useful for every single person in this room whenever you make a change, whenever you try something new. Right? It's not just for the young ones. And so everybody in this room could be a mentor. Everybody in this room could use a mentor. And the other thing I want to tell you about mentoring, it's not like a marriage. Right? You don't have to be monogamous. Like, get out there and have as many <laughs> mentors as you want. Right? Just any time you think someone can help you with something, go seek it out. The whole concept of teams as well, and this is something that you know you work with a group regularly and there are issues with communication, issues with conflict resolution. There are lots of good people that can help you do workshops and, and learn some of those skills so that you know, you're building relationships at work and you're taking care of each other. Think as well about how do you nurture relationships at home, right? And there are lots of people. So you, know, you go through your day, then there's all these people waiting for you to come home. Your partner, your children, your friends. There's a lot written about friendships and, and, and how they help us as well uh, um, in terms of you know, help being healthy. What about our parents, right? You know, it's said that um, the average working person is going to spend about 17 years as a parent of a child that's dependent on them. Then you're gonna spend about another 17 years as a child of a parent who's dependent on you. And so the whole concept of taking care of our aging uh, parents is, again, uh, something that, you know, if we're not already dealing with, we will at some point in our lives and our careers. Again, a good uh, um, concept at another time where you look at who's around you, you find somebody who's been, gone through that before or is going through it now, and reach out and connect with them. Okay, okay. talked about support systems. The biggest, you know, the bottom line is, have at least one good friend. There's a lot written about the value of friendships and um, we see friends are good for our bodies, where you know, they make us less susceptible to colds, they keep our hearts more robust, they make us feel better. Um, there's some good uh, physiology um, looking at how you know, we see an increase in oxytocin and the feel-good hormone. So we see some real physiological reasons for friendships and, and the benefits that we have. Basically, you want to spend time with people who are good for you, right? People that make you feel good about yourself and don't make you feel um, uncomfortable or, or that you're questioning yourself or second-guessing yourself. If friends aren't around, pets are great. They don't care if you're having a bad hair day. Like, all they care about is that you know how to operate a can opener, right? So a very small requirement for a lot of positive, unconditional feedback. Share your stories with your, with your friends, with your colleagues, with your family. Some of what I'm doing here with you today. I want you to recognize that the S words go together. That when you share something, you get support at the very time you need it. And if you're silent about it, there's actually a sense of shame and stigma about it. Right? So get out there and, and talk to people and tell them what, what you're going through. Calmness. It's really important to have a sense of calmness, to think ahead. And you know, here's the, here's the problem in medicine. A lot of times we're so busy, we don't know when we need to be calmer, right? So you know, a part of this is just recognizing when you need that. And then of course, having the skills to do it. And one of the things that I'll talk to you about is taking time off. Okay? You just need to have breaks. Doesn't matter how much we think we can do, we can't. And in fact, this came home to me, and, and maybe I'm, I'm preaching the converted in emergency medicine because that's where I learned it. But I remember actually when I was doing my pediatric training and uh, um, wanting, right, you see these 
poor kids in Emerge and they're crying and you, you know you could pick out the otitis media and say you know if I could just help those and they'd be instantly relieved and they could get out of here and um, and so I just really you know I don't need my breaks because I'll just see three more kids with otitis media and I'll you know and I was just racing through my day. Here's what happens though of course and you all know this right that you can clear out the Emerge, come back and it's full and it's overflowing right and so you know that's the part we don't control. The part we do control is that we are taking care of ourselves and we can get through whatever it is that's in the emergency room, waiting room, waiting for us. So you need to take breaks. Plan your holidays. Right? How many people here took at least four weeks off last year? Look around you, not a lot of hands up. This is time you can take. You have to think about why you don't really encourage you to do that because although you feel like you have this huge sense of responsibility, you're actually not at your best for all the things that you're responsible for if you're not taking a break. The Tarzan rule is a good rule. You know, as Tarzan's swinging through the jungle, he doesn't let go of one vine until he's got the next one firmly in hand. So the Tarzan rule, use it for holidays. Do not end a holiday without having your next one booked. Right? And do this for all the good things. Right? Don't, you know, if you're spending uh, an evening with a friend and it's great and you're loving it, don't end that evening without knowing when you're going to do it again. Right? Our lives are just too busy and we can't say, oh yeah, yeah, we'll do this, you know, once every four weeks. We're not going to. That's just not the way it is. And if in four weeks we start looking for a time, it'll be another four to six weeks. Right? So, you know, when you're doing something that you absolutely are enjoying and you know is helping you, don't stop it till you book the next one, right? Use that Tarzan rule to keep it going. Unplanned. This is the gift of time. So this is like you're stuck in the traffic jam, right? Um, you look at your watch a bit more often, it doesn't get you there any faster, you're stuck. You could either get all stressed out, or you could reframe that as a gift of time. This is time that you didn't have, right? So I can, you know, reach into my car and uh, um, get, you know, I know the boys listen to uh, Arcade Fire or whatever it is they're listening to. So I can get, you know, rid of their CDs and put in my own uh, Gord's Gold, right? That ages me, I know, but there you go. Um, you know, to me, that's like chicken soup, right? So I just sit there and enjoy my little, my little songs and stuff that, you know, is, is total comfort for me. I still get to where I go where I'm going about 10 minutes late, because that's the part I don't control, but the part I do control is that I don't get there all stressed out, right? And when I get there, I'm ready to just move into what it is that I need. So again, look for these gifts of time, right? So, you know, when you're at a meeting that's late starting, um, when uh, something is, uh, you know, set up and it's, things, it's not starting on time, you're at the wrong lineup at the grocery store, those are all gifts of time, right? Look for them and enjoy them. Just a word about relaxation methods in terms of helping you uh, remain calm. There's a lot available. I can actually promise you unconditional guaranteed results with any single one of them, with one proviso. That's your practice. Okay? So pick what it is, right? And, and, you know, it can be going for a run, it can be yoga, it can be playing music, it can be tai chi, it can be active, passive relaxation, it can be a relaxation exercise. It's all good and it'll all work but you have to practice. So imagine it's like you're, you play in the symphony, right? You get your music and you practice and you try and you see some parts are a little bit more difficult and you go to rehearsals and you practice the parts that you're not as comfortable with over and over and over again. So the day of the performance, you're on stage with the rest of the orchestra and you just glide into your part. The day that you're stressed, that's the performance. Too late then to start figuring out your part now, right? So, oh yeah, I was going to do that relaxation exercise and, oh, I can't remember. Was I going to be going through the woods or by a beach? Like, too late then, right? Figure it out. Decide what it is you're going to do and practice it every day, right? When you don't need it, so the day you do, it's there for you, right? Absolutely guaranteed to work. And finally, taking care of yourself. And I purposely do this. I put this at the end when we have like five minutes left to go, because guess what? That's what we do, right? We always do this at the very end when we hardly have any time for it. It's really important. And the biggest thing that I can tell you is in fact, it's probably the most important for us to do, 
right? So you know, I um, flew Air Canada from Ottawa to um, to come here for these rounds, and uh, when I'm on board, the airline attendant gave me the uh, safe, you know, the safety demonstration, right? She tells me how to put my seatbelt on in case I haven't been in a car since 1960. She tells me where the flotation devices are, and she points to under our seats. She uh, tells us where the, wing, you know, the exits are. They're in the front and over the wings and in the back. Then she says if the oxygen pressure in the cabin changes, these little masks are going to fall down. Remember, you have to tug to release the flow of oxygen. You put it over your head and you breathe normally. She tells you that if you're traveling with someone who needs your assistance, that you secure your own mask before you help them. And why does she say that? Why should you put your own mask on first? Anybody? Can't help anyone else until you help yourself. Exactly, right? You're no good to anyone. And you're absolutely no good to anyone if you've passed out. And we all kind of nod when we hear that on the airplane, but I want you to use that as a metaphor for your day to life, right? The very time that you know, you're going to grab a sandwich and emerge and you look out and you see a full waiting uh, room, you know what, go get your sandwich. Right? I'm not giving you permission to linger, but you know, you do need to grab your sandwich and have it then. Right? And like go to the bathroom. As far as I know, <laughs> as far as I know, there is no award for getting through your whole career and not stopping to pee once during the day. Right? <laughs> like I'm shocked at the number of doctors that don't have time for that. And you know, over and over and over again, and you know, in a psychiatrist's office you hear a lot of things, but I cannot tell you how many times I hear about colleagues peeing their pants at the end of the day, right? Because you are, nobody of course would talk about this to each other, but you know, I hear it all. The fact is, you know, you can make time for that. That doesn't take that much time. You're not being irresponsible and you're not being uh, uncaring and you're not being, uh, uh, you know, a bad physician. You're just taking a few minutes to do what you need to do, right? And so keep that in mind, right? Make time for those things. The next time you're in a stressful situation, imagine yourself in a room with these little oxygen masks popping down all over the place. Stop and do the metaphoric equivalent of putting yours on first, right? You will be that much better for everybody around you. So it's not a luxury, it's an investment. Exercise, again, we all know the value of exercise. The biggest reason why doctors don't exercise regularly is because we try and do it too perfectly. We set up a routine and then we throw it off. And you know, so be realistic about this. I'm watching Letterman one night and he's interviewing this actress and she's like two days postpartum. He looks her up and down, she's like size two and he says, I hear you're taking uh, you know, a year off work. She goes, yeah. He said, what are you gonna do during that time? Oh, she says, I'm going to work really hard to get back to my original weight. And he looks at her and he says, what? Seven pounds, eight ounces? Forget it. Right? <laughs> Be realistic about exercise. <laughs> nutrition, there's not much I can tell you about nutrition except that this is not good nutrition, not even the double stuff. You know, all the things, all the people in your life, all the uh, connections to them are very important. Having a healthy sex life, very important if you're in a committed relationship. A tip that I can give you is that studies consistently show that men who help out with housekeeping and childcare have better sex lives <laughs> and happier relationships. It's not my own personal study either. Get your own family doctor. How many people in this room here have their own family doctor? Okay, so about half of you. Right? So when I first started doing this stuff, I would say less than a third of, uh, or maybe like 20% of uh, Canadian physicians have their own family physician. We're now up to about 60% and I think this room kind of reflects that, right? But we need to get to 100. This is one responsibility that you can give to somebody else who actually wants it. Sleep, look around your life, sleep's the number one cause of complaint among physicians. This says it's no use, I can't sleep with this wallpaper. Right? There's usually something, it might not be this obvious, but there's some change that you can make that's going to help you sleep better. Laugh more often. There's a lot, again, of studies about the therapeutic value of humor. Um, and what we see is that, uh, you know, the average child laughs like 500 times a day. The average adult, we're down to about 15. Money, just a couple of few points and then we'll <laughs> wrap up. Money is the number two reason why doctors don't make the changes they need to, to manage their stress. We get ourselves overextended, then we have to maintain a lifestyle, right? To keep up the lifestyle that we've now uh, bought into. 
The Christopher Columbus syndrome is, is how a lot of doctors manage their money, is regards to money. We don't know where we're going, and we don't know where we are when we get there. Right? So try not to do that. Get some help. There's lots of people to help you about this. So this isn't your reason. And the number one reason is guilt. Right? We just feel too guilty to do the things that we know we should be doing for ourselves. So for this audience only, here's my rule. If there's something you're thinking of doing that you know is going to make you feel better, but you feel guilty about it, do it. It's the very thing you should do. Now, you cannot quote me in a court of law, but the fact is that if you're thinking of doing something, by the time it kind of floats up to the surface, right, as a conscious thought, if it were illegal or unethical or irresponsible or immoral, you would have censored it out a long time ago. The fact that it's still present means it's probably okay. Go do it. Okay, so this all sounds really great, but how am I actually going to do it? My final slide here is don't just try. I'd like everyone in the room, please, to just stand up. Okay. Now that you're all standing up, I'd like to just ask you, please, to sit back down. Okay. And this time, instead of asking you to stand up, I'm going to ask you just to try and stand up. And what I want you to do is look around the room, right? Your very capable colleagues, all of whom stood up like this a second ago and aren't able to do that now. Okay? This is what happens when you try nothing. Okay? So if you leave here saying, oh, yeah, that's really good. I'm going to try and do some of that. You're not going to achieve anything. I want you to, you know, I've sprinkled out a few things in my, uh, in my conversation with you today. I'd like you to think of one, two, three things perhaps, right? And then make a commitment to working on those changes. Okay? Don't, you know, go back and remember what it was about medicine that you really loved. And I want you to know that it's absolutely worth the effort to continue to enjoy that and make it enriching for you. Right? So I wish that for all of you. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Thank you.